If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to Nehemiah chapter 6. We've been studying through the book of Nehemiah, and I've sort of lost uh, track of where we should be or where we are. I know where we are tonight, but uh, with our Sunday that we skipped last week, as I even prepared the sermon for this week, I started thinking, did I already preach this or did I not? And I've, so, you know, there's a time Ronald Reagan gave the same speech twice in a row. Do you remember that event? Uh, it was right after his presidency. He gave a speech. He sat down, and then they, they applauded, and then he stood up, and he gave the entire speech verbatim again, and everyone realized we had a problem. Uh, if that is the case tonight, I'm sorry. I don't think I have. Uh, it was a good sermon when I was looking at it. I thought, this makes sense, but uh, we'll see. So I, I don't think I've repeated this, but I think we have spent some time in Nehemiah chapter 6. It's been kind of a, a slow journey here through the book, uh, but I think we've picked up some valuable lessons as we've gone. In Nehemiah chapter 6, which we'll finish tonight, the wall around the city of Jerusalem is finally completed. The work that Nehemiah has gone to Jerusalem to complete is finally done. And it is after, as we've studied, after hearing that the wall around that city, the holy city, and the gates that would secure that city and secure that wall still lie in ruins, after hearing that and praying to God, after then standing before the foreign king that Nehemiah worked for, and again praying to God, and after asking for that king's permission to go to Jerusalem, and then receiving that king's help, getting letters to travel, getting letters to use the king's uh, timbers from the king's forest, Nehemiah came to Jerusalem, he inspected the damage, we've studied all of this together, he has rallied the troops, those people who are there in the city, and the construction or the reconstruction of that wall, has begun. And almost immediately as it began, Nehemiah and those workers are plagued by enemies. And two that stand out, their names are unique, and they're mentioned uh, numerous times in this book, are a man named Sanballat and an, another, Tobiah. Those seem to be the most prominent enemies, the, the ones whose names are given, the troublemakers to Nehemiah. And we didn't study this together, but there was a time as they're rebuilding the wall that it is so treacherous and the people are so frightened that in one hand, the Bible says, uh, they are working on the wall, while in the other hand, they are holding a weapon. And so it's a serious situation as they're trying to accomplish this work. When we come to chapter 6, and as we get deep into chapter 6, we see that no, not only was this wall around the city that was in rubble when Nehemiah arrived. Not only is this wall now completed, but it is completed, chapter 6, 15, and 16 tells us, in just 52 days. It takes me 52 days to, you know, get any little project done around my house. This is a significant amount of work. No electricity, no power tools, no Home Depot or Lowe's, and yet this wall is completed in 52 days. And it is apparent to Nehemiah it's apparent to the workers, it's apparent to us as we read the text, that God was clearly involved. God's help was a big part of this work. We see that Nehemiah and the workers, ultimately, they overcome the dangers that they face. They overcome the fears that they have of these enemies that threaten them. We've talked about that together. But I think in chapter 6, we also very clearly see, and this is what I want us to consider tonight, we could clearly see some of the methods that were used, some of the tactics, we might say, that were used by those enemies in an effort to cause Nehemiah to fail. Those enemies wanted nothing more than this work to stop, than success to not occur. And as we study the text, we see how they tried to do that. And we might say tonight, you know, on a a late Sunday evening in a, a, an auditorium that's way too warm and making us sleepy and drowsy, at least it is me up here, uh, we might say tonight, well, what does that have to do with me? I'm not building a wall. You know, I, I'm not doing what Nehemiah did. I never will. I'm not building anything. I'm not in his position. I haven't been given this work to do. What does it matter to me how these enemies treat Nehemiah and how they treat those workers? But I'm not sure that the methods they use here, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, are any different than the methods that our enemies use today against us. Uh, ultimately, I think the methods, the tactics that they use are exactly the same as many that our ultimate enemy, our ultimate adversary, who is the devil, 
uses against us even today. I wonder tonight as we begin if you've ever had an enemy. Can you think in your mind, can you think back to a relationship or you know, someone you were involved with at some point who you would have considered your enemy? Has there ever been someone in your life maybe that just didn't like you no matter what you did or all they wanted to do was cause you trouble or, or cause you harm? I don't think that's fun to think about, right? It's not fun to think back on those people. Sometimes we try to not think about those people or not think about those periods in our life. I've had those people in my life, and it still bothers me to think about that and, and, to, and to think about you know, those events and, and how I handled those things. But I want us to try to imagine, I want us to try uh, to recall someone in our life that we would have considered an enemy. Maybe you can't think of anybody. Well, that's wonderful for you. I wish I was in your position. I can think of a few. Uh, but maybe someone who was against us, someone who wanted us to fail, someone who absolutely very clearly was not on our side. And I wonder if that person, I want us to consider tonight, if they used the same tactics that Nehemiah's enemies uh, used here in chapter 6. And I want us to notice first that Nehemiah's enemies planned to do him harm. They planned to harm Nehemiah. We might say in our language today that Nehemiah's enemies had it out for him. They intended to harm him. It wasn't that they said something accidentally hurtful to Nehemiah and discouraged him or, you know, made him wonder, why am I doing this anyway? No one appreciates me. We, that's not the kind of enemy that we're talking about. That's not the kind of enemy I want you to try to imagine. These people had a plan. This was their intent from the very beginning. Nehemiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, the text says, Now when it was reported to Sanballat, Tobiah, to Geshem the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies, Nehemiah says, that I had rebuilt the wall and that no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, then Sanballat and Geshem sent a message to me saying, Come, let us meet together in Chephirim in the plain of Ono. But they were planning, Nehemiah says, they were planning to harm me. The wall is completed, virtually completed. There are no more breaches in the wall. There's only one way in, or you know, the only way into the wall is where you should enter into the city, through those city gates. The gates are not quite finished, but the wall is complete. This is a huge milestone in the events that we find in the book of Nehemiah. And as that happens, this moment maybe when they celebrate, Nehemiah gets a letter from these two men, Sanballat and Geshem, saying, Nehemiah, let's have a meeting. Let's get together. Let's talk about what's happened. But we read that they're planning only to do Nehemiah harm. That is their intent. They are his enemies. They aren't sincere. They don't want to have a conversation. They don't uh, want to congratulate Nehemiah or the people on their progress or on their success. They aren't just curious about how did this happen or, you know, what are your plans for the future? Uh, they have it out for Nehemiah. They plan to do him harm. Look at verse 3 of chapter 6. Here's his response. So I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? They sent messages to me four times in this manner, and I answered them in the same way. Four times, four times separately, they sent these messages to Nehemiah, and each of those times, Nehemiah responds. And his response is, why would I stop working? Why would I stop the work that I've been given to do in order to meet with you? I'm doing a great work here. The work that we're doing as a people is an important work. Why should I stop? Give me a good reason to stop this work. Our enemies today are no different than Nehemiah's enemies. If we go back to the first century and we think about uh, Jesus and the enemies of Jesus, his enemies were no different than Nehemiah's enemies. Jesus' enemies had a plan. They planned to do him harm. In John chapter 11, right after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, the people, or some of the people, the text says, they go and tell the Pharisees all of the things that have happened. And in John chapter 11 and verse 53, the Bible says, so from that day they planned together to kill him. His enemies had a plan. 
It wasn't accidental. They didn't just say something that hurt Jesus' feelings. They got together. They figured out a way. They decided the best way that they could to harm Jesus. They intended to harm Jesus. The enemies of the early church, the first century Christians, had a plan. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, Paul is encouraging the Ephesian church and he says, As a result, we are no longer to be children. We need to mature, Paul is saying. We're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We no longer need to act like children when it comes to the word. We don't need to be tossed about here and there by anything that we hear. We don't need to fall for anything that we hear. He goes on, by the trickery of men, the craftiness in deceitful scheming. Paul says again, we can no longer be like children when it comes to the word of God or when it comes to religion. We can no longer be trusting of what others have to say by whatever is being sold, being tossed back and forth like those waves or carried away from the truth of the word of God. Paul says we can no longer fall victim to the trickery of men by the craftiness of deceitful scheming. That is planning against the church. The enemies of the first century church had a plan. Our enemies today have a plan as well. In fact, our ultimate enemy, our greatest enemy, our greatest spiritual foe, Satan, has a plan. Just like those men planned to harm Nehemiah, and just like that was their intent all along, that was certainly their plan, Satan has planned, I believe, to harm each one of us. Satan has planned for thousands of years how he can harm each one of us. Just like it was their intent all along, it has been his intent all along. And it's not by accident. It's not unintentional. It's not that he has you know, poorly thought out how to deal with people. Satan has actively planned to do us harm. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God. Why do I need to put on the full armor of God? Why do I need to put on all of those elements that we won't go through tonight? Uh, Why do I need those things? Paul says, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Put on the full armor of God. Don't leave a single element out so that, here's why you need it, so that you will be able to stand firm so that you will not be moved by the schemes of the devil. So that you will not fall. When you face the evil plans that the devil has made with you in mind, those plans to harm you, those plans to harm your soul or to cause you to fail, you will be able to stand. Our enemies and our ultimate enemy have a plan to do us spiritual harm. But thankfully, and we should be thankful, that God has a plan too. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, as Peter stands before that crowd of Jews on the day of Pentecost, again, as we said this morning, he preaches this man who delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men. The plan of God was that he could send his son who could take away the sins of the world, that we could be forgiven of those sins so that we could ultimately overcome our enemies. Our enemies have a plan, but God's plan is much greater. It is a plan by which his son would die on that cross so that no matter how threatening, no matter how dangerous, no matter how fearful we might become, how powerful, how scary our enemies might be, we can know and we can trust That God will save us. Second, as we look at the enemies of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's enemies lied about him. And I wonder now, I want you to think again, have you ever had someone uh, lie about you? Have you ever had someone who wanted to harm you bad enough that they would say anything they could think of to bring you down or to cause others to turn against you? I, I think that is probably more common when we're younger, but probably, perhaps, Uh, more hurtful when we're older. At least that's how it's been in my life. You know, as children, kids say all kinds of stuff. But as an adult, I think more of my character or, you know, I try to protect my integrity a little better than I might have thought as a child. And so maybe it, it is more damaging as we get older. 
I've had people like that in my life. I imagine you have too. And it can be upsetting. It can be greatly discouraging. It can be spiritually discouraging. And in Nehemiah chapter 6, that's exactly what happens to Nehemiah. Beginning in verse 5, the text says, Then Sanballat sent his servant to me in the same manner a fifth time with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations in Gashmu that you and the Jews are planning to rebel. Therefore, you are rebuilding the wall and you are to be the king according to these reports. Now they come a fifth time with this letter, and he says, look, here's what the letter says. Uh, Nehemiah is telling us what happened. The letter says the reports are, or the word on the street is, or what we're hearing from everybody is that you and these people who are building this wall or the people that live in this city or worship in this temple are not just building a wall to, to rebuild it, but you are planning to rebel against the foreign king who controls this area. And beyond that, you're planning to rebel, and then you, Nehemiah, are planning to be king of those people. In verse 7, the reports continue. You have also appointed prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you. A king is in Judah, and now it will be reported to the king according to these reports. So come now, let us take counsel together. Beyond the fact that rumor has it that you guys are intending to rebel... And rumor has it that, that you want to be king. You've even hired prophets to walk around Jerusalem and shout out, Nehemiah is going to be our king. Now before I go tell the real king about this, let's have a meeting, Nehemiah. In verse 8, his response, Then I sent a message to him saying, Such things as you are saying have not been done, but you are inventing them in your own mind. For all of them were trying to frighten us, thinking they will become discouraged with the work, and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Our enemies are no different than Nehemiah's enemies. If we go back to the first century and we think again about Jesus, the enemies of Jesus certainly repeatedly lied about him. As he stood before Caiaphas just hours before his death in Matthew chapter 26, we read that many false witnesses came forward. They were willing to say whatever they could think of, whatever would be necessary to have Jesus not just tarnish his reputation, but to have Jesus nailed to a cross to be put to death. The early church's enemies lied about the early church. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11, as that Sermon on the Mount begins, Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all sorts of evil against you because of me. Jesus says, people are going to lie about you because you follow me, because you are Christians. He goes on to say, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. And our ultimate enemy, our ultimate enemy, Satan, is going to lie about us. In John chapter 8, Jesus tells us, describes the devil as a liar and the father of lies. He'll say anything to cause us to sin. He'll say anything to cause us to fail. He'll say anything to cause us to lose our faith. It is the nature of our enemies to say whatever they can say, whatever they can think of, whatever they think will harm us the most. But again, thankfully, God always knows the truth. Nehemiah knew, I'm sure, that God was on his side. Nehemiah knew that regardless of what lies were told, God knew the truth. God always knew the truth. And I'm sure, I imagine, that that must have given Nehemiah some level of comfort. It didn't take the sting away, not all of it. It didn't make it less frightening or, or not frightening at all. It didn't make it less distressing or less stressful. But it did give some comfort to Nehemiah. The Bible tells us that God is just which means that God is always perfectly fair. I think about growing up, and my sister's here, and she was here this morning, she's here tonight, uh, she returned, I'm surprised, just kidding, but uh, I, am, I'm, I think about when we were growing up, there were moments where we would have a conflict, I dealt with one in my home today, not with her, but with my kids, where we stood before one of our parents at least, and we each gave our side of the story. And I'm not saying or suggesting that either of us weren't telling the truth, but those stories came from different perspectives. 
And it was our parents' job, which is sometimes a difficult job, to figure out which story is closest to the truth, right? Which is the most accurate. When a parent has to decide how to punish or, or how to train that child, they have to determine who is right and who is wrong. And that can be difficult. That can be impossible at times. But God always knows who's right. And God always knows who is wrong. In Psalm 89 and verse 14, David wrote, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. God cannot be separated from justice and righteousness. It is who God is. It's who God has always been. He cannot be separated from the truth. God knows the hearts of men. In John chapter 2 of Jesus, we read, uh, John writes that he knew all men, that he knew what was in man. One day we are going to be judged. One day we're going to stand before that judgment throne, but we are not going to be judged by what others say about us or what others have said about us, but we are going to be judged according to our own deeds. In an effort, though, to cause Nehemiah to fail, Nehemiah's enemies lied about him. They said things that were simply untrue. They invented things to say in their minds. And third, Nehemiah's enemies hired others to tempt him. They went as far as to hire others to tempt him. It was not enough to plan to harm him. It was not enough to lie about him. They hired others to tempt Nehemiah in an effort to cause him to fail. Look at chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. He says, When I entered the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was confined at home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God. Within the temple, let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you, and they are coming to kill you at night. But I said, Should a man like me flee? And could one such as I go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that surely God had not sent him, but he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired for this reason, that I might become frightened and act accordingly and sin so that they might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. Remember me, O God, or remember, O God, Tobiah and Sanballat according to these works of theirs, and also Noadiah the, the prophetess and the rest of the prophets who were trying to frighten me. The enemies of Nehemiah now have hired a man who appears to be a shut-in, a false prophet, if you will, to suggest that Nehemiah, in an effort to hide from his enemies and the dangers that he faces, that he go into the temple, a place where Nehemiah should not be, a place where Nehemiah would not be allowed to be, in an effort uh, to cause Nehemiah to sin, uh, not just against men, but to cause Nehemiah to sin against God. And again, our enemies are no different today. Judas was hired to betray Jesus. The false witnesses that stood before Jesus in his trial in Matthew chapter 26 were hired in some fashion, employed, motivated in some fashion to testify falsely against Jesus. We know that Jesus was sinless. We know that there wasn't an accusation that could be made against him. And so the people who wanted to kill him found others who would be willing to falsely testify against him. In Acts chapter 6, as Stephen is about to lose his life, something very similar, beginning in Acts chapter 6 and verse 10, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he, that's uh, Stephen, with which he was speaking. And then they secretly induced men to say, quote, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses who said this man incessantly speaks against the holy place and against the law. In Stephen's case, false witnesses stood before that council. And they stood before Stephen and they said he incessantly speaks against this holy place and against this law. And that wasn't true. Stephen had never done those things. They have hired these people to say whatever they can to cause Stephen to fail and to cause Stephen's death. And all of those works, 
are ultimately the works of our greatest and ultimate adversary, who is the devil. The pride of those men who just wanted Nehemiah's work to stop, who wanted Nehemiah's work to fail, that pride is sin that comes from the devil. The desire of these men to put Jesus to death and to put uh, Stephen to death and to persecute those first century Christians and persecute perhaps even Christians today, that desire is sin that comes from the devil. Our enemies, our ultimate enemy, our ultimate spiritual enemy, use the same tactics to harm us, uh, to hurt us today, as Nehemiah's did centuries ago. And enemies, as we know, can be hard to deal with. Nehemiah and those people knew throughout all of that, they knew, it seems, that God was on their side. They knew that the work that they were doing was great, but they were still bothered by it. Throughout the text, they were still frightened. Uh, they, they, They didn't fall into the trap of sin, but that doesn't mean throughout those situations that they weren't distressed. But when that fear came, when those evil plans were made, when those lies were told, when others were even hired to tempt them into sin, to cause them to fail, over and over And over again throughout this book, Nehemiah turned to God. That's what he did every single time. In what might be the most difficult situations he's ever experienced in his life or ever would experience the most difficult moments, Nehemiah repeatedly turned to God. Chapter 6 and verse 9 again. For all of them were trying to frighten us, thinking they will become discouraged with the work and it will not be done Nehemiah says, but now, O God, strengthen my hands. All they're trying to do is scare us. God, help us to continue this work. In the most difficult moment, he turns to God. In verse 13 again, he was hired for this reason, that I might become frightened and act accordingly in sin, so they might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. Nehemiah says, remember, O my God. What he's doing is now trusting in God, not just turning to him, but saying, God, I need your help. Help me with these enemies. Help stand against my enemies. Help me stand against them. And ultimately, the wonderful news, we see that it works. In verse 15 of chapter 6, so the wall was completed on the 25th of the month of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard of it and all the nations surrounding us saw it, They lost their confidence, for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. And there are two lessons I want us to take away tonight. Number one, it might sound ridiculous, but don't be an enemy. Don't be anyone's enemy. Don't be the person that plans to do someone else harm. You say, well, Matt, that's not important. That's not important in the church. That doesn't happen among members of the church. We know better than that. I believe we do. But I also believe it's been a problem in the past. It may be a problem outside of this building and other relationships. Do not be the one that plans anyone harm. Do not be the one that lies about anyone. Do not be the one who is willing to do whatever it takes or go to great lengths to cause anyone to fail in any situation. Be adamant tonight that you will not be an enemy, that I will not be an enemy. And second, when you face enemies in this life, turn to God. Trust in God and pray to God. That's what Nehemiah did. Our enemies are no different tonight than Nehemiah's were. Our enemies are no different tonight than the enemies of Christ were. Our enemies are no different tonight than the enemies of the first century or any Christian that has ever lived were. Treat our enemies in the way that Nehemiah treated his. Tonight we offer the invitation to anyone who might need to respond if you have never obeyed the gospel. The Bible teaches that when a person hears the word of God and they believe it, when they are willing to uh, repent of sin in their life and confess the name of Jesus before men as we all witnessed this morning, that person can go down into the waters of baptism and have their sins washed away. If you haven't made that decision in your life, we encourage you to make that decision tonight. Maybe you have been baptized, but you have sin in your life. Maybe it is sin that is public in nature. 
Uh, others know about it. Others have seen it. And others know that you need to repent of that sin. If that is the case, uh, you may need to repent publicly. We pray that you will. Let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Maybe you've been a Christian for decades of your life and you have a sin that no one knows about, that you've been carrying, that you've been struggling with. Don't leave this place carrying that burden of separation and sin. Repent of that sin and pray to God to forgive you, and he will. If you need the prayers of this congregation for those or any other reason, we hope that you'll make it known. Come forward while we stand, while we sing this invitation song.